You know, in the book of Revelation, there's a meal that's celebrated. In fact, it's a feast we find talked about, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But do you know that God has had some very important meals with his followers all throughout biblical history? And of course, we're looking forward to the great feast yet to come, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Today, we're going to celebrate communion here at Mount Pisgah but in a little bit different way. And we're going to talk about some of these meals that God has had with mankind. If you have any prayer requests or needs, please feel free to put them in the comment section below. We're glad that you've joined us and may the grace and peace of the Lord God Almighty be yours both now and evermore. And as you're being seated, let's open up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Luke 22. This morning, as we're going to celebrate communion, we're going to talk about one heaven of a meal. Luke 22, beginning in verse 14. Luke 22, 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes." And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is at hand. And he says, He is with me at the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, been determined, but woe to that man by whom he has been betrayed. The heaven of a meal, one heaven of a meal. This is an interesting experience in the life of the disciples. Reason being is because it is a covenant meal. It is a moment when the new covenant, as Jesus describes it, is being sealed and it is being completed once and for all and would be fulfilled in just a few hours as he would die on the cross. Covenant and the covenant meal especially is one of the most powerful pictures in the scripture concerning and revealing the gospel. And it has been something that we see started back in the book of Genesis and carries right through to this sealing of the new covenant. It ultimately there will be a celebratory covenant meal in the kingdom when Jesus returns. In fact, this evening at sundown, the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, begins for the next week. And this is pictured for us in the book of Revelation, as we'll see later. And it is all going to be about a wedding celebration, a celebration as a result of a covenant meal that we will have there in the presence of God. Back in the time of Christ, and even way back into the book of Genesis, there was a special process that a young man and a young woman would go through before they entered into marriage. And there were two particular stages to this whole process, betrothal and then ultimately marriage. Now, when a young Jewish man had his heart set on marrying a particular young woman, he would discuss his choice with his father. And then with and only with his father's approval, he would then go and take a journey to the young woman's house, and there he would come with three very important items. One would be the marriage contract or the covenant terms of their relationship. He would come with a suitable bridal gift, And then the third thing he would come with would be a skin of wine. 
Now, the covenant terms were specifically a joint effort between the bridegroom and his father. And they would lay out all of the groom's promises that he was going to make to this bride and the conditions of their marriage. And so the gift he came with, as he came with the covenant, he would also come with a gift particularly, and this was a gift the very best that he could afford, the very best that he could offer to her as his potential bride. And this gift, when he gave it to her, became the permanent property of the young woman, regardless of whether or not she actually consented to the marriage. Now, obviously, before this process, the young man would seek the approval of the bride's father or, if he was not around, her brothers, before he would come with the gift and the proposal. But ultimately, it was the young woman who had the final say as to whether or not she would consent to this marriage. Now, obviously, there's a picture of this back in the book of Genesis, chapter 37, when Abraham sent his servant Eliezer to go and find a bride for Isaac. And when he went to find this bride, this is the, 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 the covenant terms had already been agreed upon, and he went with the covenant terms. He also took the very best gifts that Abraham could send with him for Isaac, his son. And then, of course, ultimately, though, Rebecca had to say yes. Her brothers and her fathers asked her, do you consent to this? After all the terms and everything had been laid out, and of course, she said yes. So the bride ultimately had the final word of agreement to enter into this relationship. And then finally, once she said yes, then wine was used to seal the betrothal in a ceremony in which both of them drank from the same cup, and this cup was called the cup of of blessing. And so once that was done, the betrothal was sealed in the minds of everyone. They were already as good as married, but the marriage would not, they were considered legally married, but it would not be consummated. The marriage would not be con consummated until a later time. From that period, the bride would cover herself with a veil over her face, and then this was a symbol that she'd entered into a covenant relationship, a betrothal covenant relationship with a young man, and that she was not available to anybody else now. She was taken. She would also take a lamp, and she would fill it with oil, and she would set it up in a window or in a strategic place, probably a window, so that the bridegroom would always know that she was mindful of their covenant relationship now. And everyone else would see this whenever they would go to her home or maybe pass by if it was set up in a window. Now, the bridegroom at that point would go back to his father's house. And from that moment on, for a period of about one year, no less than nine months, he began to build a particular bridal chamber. This was called a chadar. And he would begin to construct this. But he would stay away for a good period in order to prove and to prepare for the arrival of his bride, but in order to prove and to test her faithfulness to him over this period of time. So he would be absent. And he would give her as well sufficient time to make herself ready for the marriage. And so the bridegroom would begin to construct this bridal chamber and was overseen, the work was overseen by his father. And then if he was ever asked by any of his friends, how much longer, how much longer until the wedding? How much longer until you go and get your bride? And his response would be, only my father knows the day and the hour. And he would not go and get the bride until the father told him, now it's time for you to go get your bride. Now, as you think about all of this, as he's building this and everything is being prepared, obviously, I think you can begin to see some very clear pictures here of the events that took place in the life of Christ, as well as this last covenant meal that he shared with his disciples. 
The covenant meal, as I said, goes all the way back into the book of Genesis. The very first one that we really know about, we see that it was a covenant meal when Abraham came back from defeating the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and the the high priest Melchizedek met him and when he came out to meet Abraham, he brought bread and wine. And they sat down and they had a covenant meal. And Melchizedek confirmed the covenant that God had already stated to Abraham about how he was going to bless him and make him a great nation. And again, there was an affirmation of this covenant relationship. You see it again throughout Genesis. But the really big first covenant meal, which we have with God and his people, is found over in the book of Exodus. So if you look over at Exodus chapter 24, What had happened was God had given the commandments to Israel, and Moses had recited all the commands of God to Israel. And in Exodus chapter 24, in verse 1, there is a cool event that begins to unfold. Exodus 24, 1, it says, Then God said to Moses, Come up to Yahweh. You and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and you all shall worship at a distance. They're at the base of Mount Sinai, and God tells Moses to bring these men up with him. Moses alone, however, shall come near to Yahweh, but they shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to all the people all of the words of Yahweh and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, and they said, All the words which Yahweh has spoken, we will do. The words which they were speaking were the words of the covenant relationship God wanted to them. He spells out the terms of the covenant. The people say, We agree. We will do these things. We're ready to enter into a marriage relationship with the God of creation. And so they all agreed to it. And it says that they then, Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh. Then he arose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to Yahweh. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So he reiterated the terms of the covenant relationship, and again they agreed. Then, verse 9, it says, Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they beheld God, and they ate and they drank. Covenant meal now. They've had the terms of the covenant spoken out and spelled out for them. People have said, yes, the representatives of the people go and have a covenant meal in the presence of God, eating and drinking in his presence. And Yahweh said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments which I have written for their instruction. So Moses arose with Joshua, his attendant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. But to the elders, he said, remain here for us until we return to you. Behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a legal matter, let him approach them. Then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. Now, as we've talked about, I think, I know we did on Wednesday night, the real true Mount Sinai has probably been discovered in Saudi Arabia. The traditional one that's in the Sinai Peninsula was not the real Mount Sinai. That was something that Constantine's mama basically said that this is the place and declared it to be that. But in reality, the true Mount Sinai, as Paul the Apostle tells us in Galatians, has always been in Saudi Arabia. And all of the evidence shows that. Well, as you go up, and there's, I've got two little pictures. As you go up on this mountain, you come up the side of the mountain and you see this flat area at the base of the mountain over here. This flat area, open area, is where it's believed that it was where, where God met and had that covenant meal with Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. And the next slide will show you, right there, you see the area at the base here that's flat, and then on up, you see the top of the mountain, which is interestingly charred black. It's charred black. There's no explanation. It's not a volcanic mountain. It's not volcanic rock. 
but the top of that mountain is charred black. And again, it's been there all along at the base of that mountain. Actually, now you can go, and there's a lot of archaeological expeditions that are going over there now. The pillars that we just read about, you see the remains of those pillars. You see the remains of altars. You see the remainders of cattle stalls where every, the cattle were led through up for sacrifice. Not far from this place, you see the split rock that's standing wide open. It's huge. It's a gigantic a miracle standing out in the middle of nowhere, which has showed evidence of massive amounts of water flowing from it down into the valley. I mean, all of the evidence points to that this is the true place. But this area right here in that flat area is where they, the elders met and had this covenant meal with God. Joshua stayed at the base of this mountain and he could not back beyond here where we're, this picture is taken from. You go on back down into the valley below. And Joshua wouldn't have been able to see all that was going on while Moses was up at the mountain, but he could hear the sound of celebration going on when they were worshiping the idol, the golden calf down below. And Joshua was like, well, there's a sound of merriment. And Moses said, no, it's not the sound of merriment, but they've, they've sinned against God. And they would come down and, of course, Moses would take the tablets and smash them and they had to drink the bitter waters. But this is a place where this first covenant meal took place between God and Israel. Now, we just read in Luke about the covenant that God made here. Did Israel keep her terms of the covenant? No, she couldn't. She constantly was an unfaithful bride. She was a betrothed, but she was unfaithful to her bridegroom. And therefore, God says in Jeremiah, and ultimately also in Ezekiel, he said, I'm gonna make a new covenant with the house of Israel, but I'm gonna be the one to do it. I'm going to write the laws in their heart. I'm going to give them a new heart. I'm going to put my laws in their mind. I'm going to do all this. And everybody's wondering, how is our God going to do what he would do? Well, Christ, the Son of God himself, comes and takes on human flesh and became one of us. And as he lived among us, he gathers his followers together at that last Passover meal and he took the cup we read after the meal, which saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And the cup that was always and is always still to this day drank after the Passover meal is referred to as the cup of blessing. The same cup that a betrothal, betrothed woman and a potential bridegroom share together when the covenant agreement has, is finalized and she agrees to the ceremony, the same one. The Gospel of Luke tells us, when the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles. He said to them, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup, gave thanks, take, eat, divided among yourselves. Each one of them had to say yes. I agree. I'm entering into this relationship. And he says, he gave the bread and broke it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he says that he took the cup, he gave thanks, and they said, drink from it, as Matthew records, all of you. All of them drank from the same cup of blessing with Christ, promising that he would not drink of the fruit of the vine again until he could drink it with them in the kingdom. And of course, later on that evening, he would be arrested. He would be separated from them. But you remember Jesus' words to John in the Gospel of John 14, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. Literally, when he talks about a house, he's not talking about a literal house. That word really can mean family. In my Father's family, there are many places for you. Many dwelling places for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going away to prepare a place for for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you myself. The bridegroom is going back home and he's going to be preparing the bridal chamber. And he's going to stay there until the father gives the word to go get your bride. Betrothal took place at his final Passover, just like it would have in any normal relationship. In fact, the apostle Paul himself in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, talking about communion, he actually says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? 
He called it the cup of blessing. And again, they all knew. Betrothal, betrothal. We are betrothed. And Paul tells the Corinthians, the Corinthians, have I not betrothed you to one husband, to Christ? You are in the betrothal period. We are in the betrothal period. Our faithfulness is being demonstrated now to our king, to our bridegroom as we live here. He is waiting for the father to tell him, go and get your bride. He is waiting for the Father, and as Jesus himself said, only my Father knows the day or and the hour. And you see, when we understand that Jesus was betrothing to himself and betrothing himself to a bride at that Passover meal that he took with his disciples, we also begin to understand the covenant relationship between the bread and the juice, the wine that we drink. We understand that when we partake of this, every time we celebrate it, we are celebrating our spiritual commitment and relationship to our bridegroom. We are reminding of ourselves of his commitment to us and of our desire to be faithful and loyal to him. We're reaffirming our covenant relationship with him and we're renewing our pledge of faithfulness to Jesus. You see, from the bridegroom's standpoint, the Lord Jesus' standpoint, the marriage contract was delivered. He gave the terms and the word. Scripture tells us, and Jesus said in John 17 to his Father, I have given them your word. I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He is the word become flesh, John says. He is the covenant. It's him, and he has given himself to us. But not only that, he's also given us his finest gift. On Acts chapter 2, he poured out the gift of his spirit. He gave himself. Not only in the finest gift of giving himself on the cross for us, but he's also given us and bestowed his greatest gift, the gift of his spirit, to us as his people. The cup has been drunk and the covenant has been sealed now. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, he says, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who has also sealed us and given us the pledge of his spirit in our hearts. The pledge, the down payment, the bridal gift. He has done that. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, In him also you, after listening to the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. The writer of Hebrews closes out Hebrews. He says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant. Our Lord Jesus, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will by doing what is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. But you know, we're a lot like Israel, aren't we? When I look at my life and I look at the lives of many that I've known, but I can only speak for myself, knowing myself, throughout my walk with Jesus, I have not always been as faithful as I should be. How about you? Have all of us blown it? Have we all maybe not been the loyal, faithful bride that we promised to be to our bridegroom? Well, we're all guilty, and we know that. But here is what's amazing about the new covenant. In Christ, 100% man and 100% God Christ represented God, and he also represented us in this covenant. He represented me and you because he knew we couldn't do it. He did it for us. He entered into human flesh, and as a human being, he battled with the same temptations we did, but bent that twisted, dark will of humanity back. Toward God. 
he healed and saved it for you and me. And he represented God as well in this covenant. When he drank that cup, he drank it with us and for us. As he took that cup of blessing, you took that cup of blessing. And he was representing you in a promise of loyalty and faithfulness in the covenant. His faithfulness, Paul tells us, is our faithfulness. You ever doubted? You ever had struggle with unbelief in your life? Wonder if this is all real? Wonder if it's all true? Doubted the promises of God? Doubted whether you belong to him? Had those moments of insecurity because of that doubt? But you know what? When the Father looks at you, there's only one faith that he sees and one faithfulness, and that's his son's. And it's perfect. So relax. It's not up to you. Not up to me. It was all up to Christ representing us. His faithfulness is our faithfulness. He keeps the covenant terms for us. He does. He did, and he continues to do so. He keeps us for the wedding. The Scripture tells us he is preserving us. He is going to present us pure and spotless before his throne. That's what he's doing by the work of his spirit in us as we walk with him each day. He has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to assure us of this covenant relationship. And he, he's the contract. He's the gift. And he is the cup and the bread. It's all him. That's why I said, and I've said so many times and said last week, our response to salvation, again, there's so many people that they struggle with doubt about their salvation. Did I believe enough? Did I believe right? It is not your belief that it's dependent upon. It's his. It's his. He did believe enough for you. He did trust enough for you. He does. And he'll never fail in that. So relax. Rest in that. Live our lives simply by living it, saying, thank you. Thank you. That is faith. That is the belief in the good news. And it says, thank you, God. When I'm reading the scripture, I'm not doing it to try to keep my part of the covenant. I'm just saying, thank you. When I pray, I'm saying, thank you. When I do things that are in obedience to him, it's my way of saying, I thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you. Because he did it all. And that takes all the pressure off of us. All the pressure off of us. It's not up to us. We know that there's going to be one more marriage meal. Let's look real quick in Revelation 19. There's coming a time, and we'll get to this later on as we go through Revelation when there's this declaration that is made in Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9, where the hosts of heaven say this, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Do you remember what Jesus said? I'm not going to drink it again, the fruit of the vine, until I drink it with you anew in the kingdom of God. And everybody wonders, What are we going to be eating at that kingdom meal? Well, God tells you what you're going to be eating at that kingdom meal. Isaiah chapter 25. He gives us a good description of that meal that day when it comes, that final marriage feast. Notice what God says. Isaiah 25, verse 6. This will be the final covenant meal together. It says, And Yahweh of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. 
a banquet of aged wine, the fruit of the vine. Choice pieces with marrow, literally choice pieces of meat. And refined aged wine. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all the peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all the nations. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe away every tear from all faces. He will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken, it will be said in that day by his people, they will say this, Behold, this is our God in whom we have hoped that he would save us. This is Yahweh in whom we have hoped. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. See, I told you everything that's in the book of Revelation has already been spoken of in the Old Testament. It's going to be a feast like no feast we've ever seen in the presence of God. Just like the elders had that meal in the presence of God, we will have that meal in the presence of our Lord. And he says he himself will serve us. He himself will serve us. So as we come this morning to this time to celebrate, we're reaffirming with gratitude, yes, our devotion, it's our love. We're, this is one of the ways we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you did for me, what you're doing for me, what you will do for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you with gratitude from our hearts. We're going to have some things up on the screen for you to say, and we're going to go through a little communion service leading up to our time of communion together. Let's go ahead and bring that first one up. Where it says, people, that means you. All right? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give thanks. For you are face to face with the Son and the Spirit, eternal life, dwelling together in the divine dance of holy unity from before time and forever. Fountain of life, source of all goodness, you made all things in the Son, and in Him all things hold together and are filled with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor and brilliance of your kind intention. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you day and night. Joining with them is a kingdom of priests. Representing and giving voice on behalf of all creation, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we say, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. We acclaim you, Holy Lord, the three in one, glorious in love. Your goodness and kindness reveal that you are endlessly and unalterably for us. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care so that in fellowship with you, our Father, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When we were plunged into the darkness of the lie, Believing that you were not for us, too holy to look at us, you contradicted the lie, never turning from us, and you took sides with us against the accuser, promising the crushing of his head by the woman's seed. In your wrath, the passionate no of your love that refused our abandonment and destruction, you came into our darkness to seek us until you found us. Father, you love the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only son to be our savior, not to save us from you, but to take us to you. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. And to fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death and rising from the grave, destroyed death taking with him the keys of hell and the grave and raising humanity to be seated in heavenly places, making the whole creation new and to expose the lie that we were unworthy servants under the gaze of your disapproval. You sent the Holy Spirit, the very spirit of adoption who continually intercedes for us, convincing us that we are truly your beloved children by whom we cry, Abba, Daddy. When the hour came for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, 
Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his people and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the undoing of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for remembrance of me. So, Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption. We recall Christ's death and his descent among the dead, and we proclaim his resurrection and ascension to your right hand and announce our sharing in his glory, we in him, he in us, and together in you, and offering to you the gifts you have given to us, the bread and this cup. We will praise you and we bless you We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord, our God. Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit brings all things to our remembrance and causes us to be partakers of your divine nature. Now sanctify these gifts, showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life, the cup of our salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and this cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one, your holy universal apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal our unity, guard our faith, and preserve us in your peace. And grant that we may find our inheritance patriarchs and prophets and apostles and martyrs and all the saints who have found favor with you in all times and all places. We praise you in union with them and we give you glory through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. O thou from whom the breath of life comes, who fills all realms of sound, light, and vibration, may your light be experienced in my utmost holiest. Your heavenly domain approaches. Let your will come true in the universe just as on earth. Give us understanding for our daily need. Detach the fetters of faults and bind us like we let go the guilt of others. Let us not be lost in superficial things, but let us be freed from that what keeps us from our true purpose. From you comes the all-working will, the lively strength to act, the song that beautifies all and renews itself from age to age. Sealed in trust, faith, and truth, I confirm with my whole being. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. (coughs) The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance of that Christ died for you and as you, and you feed on him. This, his resurrected, ascended, and glorified body in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Robert, you guys will come and pass out bread and juice.
body of Christ, the bread from heaven. Amen. 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 The blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. Amen. Amen. Let's read this together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's all stand together. Many of you remember the movie Sound of Music? You remember that movie? Yeah. yeah. You remember a little song in there called Edelweiss? Yeah. Well, there's a chorus that goes to the tune of that that we're going to sing as we close as we go out this morning. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, from this place. May you bless us and protect us. May you, Adonai, make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May you, Adonai, lift your countenance toward us and give us your shalom, your peace. In your son, Yeshua, our Messiah's name, and all of God's people said, amen. Be blessed as you go.